Hi, I'm Maria Friedman, and welcome to No Filter. When couples therapist Esther Perel speaks to large groups of people about her area of expertise, sex and relationships, she asks the audience to raise their hands if their lives have ever been affected by infidelity. Maybe it was one of their parents. Maybe it was their own partner. Maybe it was them. Or maybe they were the third party. She says around 80% of the room raises their hand. And I'm going to ask you the same question. Is your hand up? Get ready to listen to the most fascinating conversation about relationships and infidelity you have ever heard. It's never been easier to cheat and never been harder to have secrets. That's just one of the truth bombs that Esther drops that will stay with you. She's the author of a new book called State of Affairs, Rethinking Infidelity. And in our conversation about that today, we cover a lot of ground. Why do people cheat? Why do happy people cheat? Is infidelity a deal breaker? Who cheats more, men or women? Are our expectations of marriage too high? Should your partner be your best friend? You're going to love this episode. Here is Esther Perel. Your first book, Mating in Captivity, uh, I've heard you say that you, your, your interest in infidelity as a relationships therapist came from the Monica Lewinsky scandal with Bill Clinton when you noticed that America was just quite obsessed with this idea of cheating and what it meant. I would probably say before the scandal, mm. um, I had already, um, I mean, I basically have been a couples therapist since 83 and uh, and devoted my life's work and career to uh, helping people create thriving relationships. So um, what is at stake in relationships that are vital and vibrant and with a very clear understanding all along that it was going to be the quality of our relationships that determines the quality of our lives. So this was part of it. Um, at one point, Yes, I was ex- intensely interested in a fundamental cultural difference that I was observing, which was that in the United States, there was great tolerance for divorce and little tolerance for infidelity, whereas many other parts of the world were, that were more family-oriented, actually. Do you mean Europe? Greater, Europe, Africa, the Middle East, Asia, uh, wherever marriage isn't just between two individuals, And wherever marriage isn't meant to bring you personal happiness only, Mm. but wherever marriage is actually a a, a kernel from which you support and sustain a network of relationships. So there was was more tolerance for, for infidelity when there was less pressure on marriage to be everything. I've heard you talk about that, that we place so much pressure in the, these modern times for marriage to complete us. The compromise around infidelity for the sake of preserving the family happens in more traditional societies where the centrality of the family comes before the happiness of the individual. And that, of course, has always been done by the courtesy of women. The model that we experience today, the romantic ideal in which we are turning to one person to give us what once an entire village used to provide, meaning that we still want that same person to give us the the old bastions of expectations of traditional marriage, companionship, economic support, children and family life, and social respectability. But we also want the same person to be a best friend and a trusted confidant and a passionate lover and an intellectual equal and the person who inspires us to strive for the best version of ourselves that sense that one person can be our anchor and our wave, that that same person will provide us with stability and commitment, but also with novelty and freshness and surprise and mystery, that is a very new model. And it's gone even a step further now, which is that we are past the romantic ideal and we are now into the soulmate. Mm. And the soulmate is really the place where we have begun to conflate the spiritual and the relational. We are basically looking for in romantic love for the very things that we used to look for in religion. Ecstasy, transcendence, wholeness, belonging, meaning. We want our earthly loves to give us the sense of perfection that we used to turn to in the sanctuary of the divine. That one and only pursuit that we have at this point 
in the midst of a digital culture in which we have to find a one and only among a thousand choices at our fingertips. How did that we how did we get to the soulmate? How did how did that become a thing that we were all aspiring to? Secularization. I think the secularization mm. of the Western world, and this is also Robert Johnson's view as a wonderful uh, Jungian analyst, secularization has turned romantic love into the most intense energy system of the Western psyche. It's right. in romantic love that we seek all the things that we used to turn for in religion. But it's as if God disappointed us. Our children still died and they were still tsunamis. So now we turn to our partner to give us that sense of purpose, that sense of meaning, that we matter, that we are whole, that we belong with someone, mm. that, that we're one. Um, and we have literally turned to romantic love as the new religion. And we have a second mm. religion, which is consumerism. But that's the other version. I blame Tom Cruise for a lot of this because in that movie, Jerry Maguire, Renee Zellweger's in the lift and she talks about hearing this this blind couple they're communicating in light sign language. And one of them says to the other, you complete me. And she then carries this with her as the standard by which she wants to find, you know, true love. She wants mm -hmm. someone that will complete her. And that idea, I've always really railed against that as a feminist and just as a human because firstly, no one else should complete you, should they? And can anyone else complete you? You know, it's the Plato, Plato's uh, view as well in terms of the, the, the shadow part of who we are and the quest for completion. Other people can make us feel connected. Mm. Other people can give us a sense of hope when we feel hopeless. Other people can hold us while we are collapsing. Other people can believe in us when we are mired in self-doubt. So in that sense, we need a collective. We need a lot of people around us mm. to sustain us, to feed from the same way that we don't just eat one food. Uh, we mm. need in the emotional nourishment, we need also a, br a broad range of people from whom to feed from and who we feed in return. That is different from the one and only that is my true soulmate, my second half, the extension of me. That is a different model. I think we our relationships are stronger when we have a solid relationship with a partner that exists in the middle of other powerful relationships mm. with friends, with mentors, with colleagues, with siblings, a village, a village, the modern village. The modern village is different from the traditional village. In the traditional village, you had zero freedom, but at least you knew who you were. The village gave you a sense of identity, belonging and community and continuity, but zero freedom. We don't want to forego the freedoms that we have today but we still want to belong to a certain village. And everybody's writing about belonging at this point because we really want both. We want the commitment and we want the freedom. We want the sense of, of partnership and we want the sense of personal expression. Hey, I'm just jumping in to interrupt the most beautiful accent you've ever heard. I mean, I would listen to Esther Perel reading the phone book. I had to, while I was recording this, I had to try to keep concentrating because I just wanted her to keep talking forever <laughs> and never stop. Um, a bit of background on Esther. She's 59 years old. She lives in New York with her husband, Jack Saul, and they have two sons. She's been married about 30 years. She is a psychotherapist and a self-described expert on relationships and sexuality. And that accent you can hear is actually Belgian. She speaks nine languages, but she grew up in Belgium with her parents, who were both Polish-born Holocaust survivors. She's done a TED Talk called The Secret to Desire in a Long-Term Relationship, uh, and it's received almost 8 million views. Esther has developed um, in the last few years a bit of a cult following in the realm of Brene Brown and Liz Gilbert and Glennon Doyle and a little bit Oprah, all of those kind of extraordinary self-help truth tellers uh, who have enormous followings and who are really big thinkers on, on subjects that particularly affect women. Anyway, back to Esther and that glorious voice. So in Fidelity, why do people cheat? Is it because they're not feeling that that person is giving them everything and they're, they're going out 
and looking for it in an inappropriate way or in, in an unfaithful way, I guess. Mm-hmm, mm-hmm. There are many reasons why people cheat. Well, let's begin by saying that in the past, people cheated because marriage wasn't supposed to deliver love and passion. Today, mm. people stray because marriages fail to deliver the love and the passion that it promised. That's the first shift. Mm. People stray because they've experienced loneliness in their relationship, neglect, indifference, sexual frustration, um, loads of discontents in the relationship itself that lead them to feel open to the kindness of strangers. People stray also even when they are in very strong and good and happy relationships. And that is one of the strong findings for me in writing this new book. Why would you stray if you're in a happy relationship? Because straying isn't necessarily a symptom of a relationship gone awry because affairs are about hurt and betrayal and deception, but they are also about longing and loss and self-seeking. It's the quest for lost parts of oneself. It's the quest for a sense of aliveness, for vitality. It's the quest to reconnect with the unlived lives. There is an element of loss and longing that people talk about all over the world Mm. when they talk about why they took a risk, sometimes after decades of faithfulness, of strong, intense fidelity to a partner, and they crossed a line that they themselves never thought that they would cross and at the risk of losing everything. So you always ask for a glimmer of what? What would make people take such a risk? And what they tell you is really the connection, the quest to deal with with, with a quest for novelty, a quest mm-hmm. for intimacy, a quest for closeness, a quest for feeling desired when they have felt utterly unwanted for so long. It's, it's a longing that is at stake. It's not about cheating. And it's not about betraying, even though those are the impact and the effect that it has, of course, on the partner and on the relationship. And I think it's very important to to say, you know, here I am after 30 something years working with hundreds of couples who have been shattered by by infidelity. And this very, very common experience is so poorly understood. I asked audiences today in this conference Thousands of people that were in the room, have you been affected by infidelity in your life? And 80% of the people Mm. said yes, because they were the children of, the friends of, the person who was betrayed, the lover in the triangle, Mm. every role. This experience is so widely widespread and so common and often so poorly understood. And to try to understand it isn't a justification and isn't a condoning, but we need to do better in helping people overcome one of the worst crises that can happen in a relationship, especially for me, who believes in hope and strength and resilience of relationships. What better way to go find out what trust is than to look at the breaches of trust or Mm. to look at, you know, infidelity to understand what is fidelity. I suppose the question that so many people will have in their mind is, can a relationship survive infidelity? Yes, of course it can. Of course it can. It depends. You know, today I was asked, you know, here is this partner of mine and he's done it over and over and over again. And that's a very different story. That's a person mm-hmm. who has no regard for you. That's a person who um, does, is not connected to the consequences of his action. And cheating probably is one of the many ways in which he expresses this complete disregard. So that is a very different outcome potential. But the vast majority of people that that stray are actually people who often act in a way that is actually contrary to their own values. They believe in monogamy, no less. They've been monogamous often for a long time. You don't learn much from looking at chronic philanderers. You know, mm. you learn mm. from looking at people who actually, when you talk to them, they used to be very, they, they never imagined that they would be on, on the, this side and this could happen to them that, and they are trying to understand themselves. So can you overcome an affair? Yes. And the most important thing for that is to also understand a few things. Affairs can either be break it or make it. 
Mm-hmm. Affairs can either end the relationship that was already dying of the divine, or it can actually be one of the most powerful alarm systems that jolt people out of a state of complacency and lets them realize how much they stand to lose. Affairs often will lead relationships afterwards to a level of honesty that many people tell you we have never been as honest before. We are way deeper, way more connected, way more intimate than we used to be. And that is also because they realize that you don't judge an entire relationship by the affair, that often these affairs happen in good relationships, in good marriages, and that you make a decision about the the affair is not the same as making a decision about the marriage, that you don't throw the whole thing out and you say the entire story, our entire relationship was a Mm. lie, it's a fraud, it meant nothing, none of it, this puts this crisis as if it stands to eradicate years of positive marital capital. And that is not fair to the couples. So the idea that if someone cheats once, they're going to cheat again, and that Mm -hmm. that once you've broken that barrier, it's broken forever and it can't be repaired and you can't be faithful after you've cheated because, you know, how can you be trusted? Is that not necessarily true? That's correct. Not for everybody. Mm. No, it's not a golden rule. You would never say that about somebody who drinks, that they are forever, ever going to drink again. No, you say that they need to be more careful, that they need to be more supported, that they need to check on their vulnerabilities, on their weaknesses, on their isolation, on the fact that they don't talk their needs, that they are at risk. But that doesn't mean that you are convinced that because somebody drank once, they are forever going to be drinking. We don't apply the standard to just about anything. The majority of people are not repeat offenders. Mm. And we know that. So what makes you overcome it? The fact that the person who has hurt you acknowledges the hurt, that they can express remorse, that they can express guilt for hurting you. The fact that as a couple, you try to make sense of how this happened. And are there things that you can do in the relationship to buttress, to strengthen, to create buffers to those risks? Was there a neglect that was going on between the partner? Has there been an intensification of conflict or a complete estrangement? What happened that this ecology allowed for this to happen? How do we develop a different level of honesty with each other? Couples will create a new vision after the relationship, after this crisis. Mm. And the idea that because this has happened once, it is bound to happen again after it didn't happen for 24 years before. We are taking people who have been often very responsible citizens, you know, and we trash them. And we trash not just the person who has strayed. We actually trash even more so today the person who chooses to stay after Mm -hmm. an affair with their partner. It used to be that divorce was the stigma. Mm. Now it is choosing to stay when you can leave. That is the new shame. And we tell particularly women and even more so men, get out. There is only one solution to everything. Leave. And as if people didn't stand to lose everything that the marriage gives them access to, a sense of, of respectability, a community, two parents for children, economic support. I mean, mm. we do, you know, there's a lot at stake in a marriage and we need more than one solution. There is no one size fits all to just say to people, get out because by definition, if this happened, it is bound to happen again instead of mm. saying it didn't happen for 20 years before. So I'm sorry, it did. When a man says it didn't, it didn't, or a woman, but often, more often a man, it says it didn't mean anything, Mm -hmm. That's such a cliche, but you're saying that can actually be true. Well, what does it mean, right? Some people say it didn't mean anything because it was just sex. And some Mm. people say it didn't mean anything because there was no sex. (laughs) And it was just an emotional connection. So people play with this. It didn't mean anything, meaning to say it wasn't meant to threaten our relationship. Ah. I have never had any intention of leaving you and us. And then people say, well, why didn't you go and talk about your unhappiness or your discontents or your unmet needs to your partner? And the truth is, as a person who has sat in the trenches of hundreds of people who've gone through this, is that sometimes people did try to talk and they tried many times to talk. Mm. And unfortunately, 
Finally, it took this to get their partner's attention. And the people who know it and are honest about it say it. They say it. I wasn't, I wasn't listening. I didn't believe. I didn't care enough. It didn't matter to me. I thought this was fine enough. I thought we could go on like this. And it takes the fear of almost losing everything that you actually care for to, to, to pay attention to pay attention differently. And both people start to pay attention. And I think that people deserve the opportunity to have a different start with each other. You know, I often say, today, mo most of us are going to have two or three relationships in our adult life. Mm. Some of us are going to do it with the same person. Ah. And that means that after the crisis of an affair, your first marriage is over. And the question is, do you want to have a second one with each other? You reset the terms, you, you, it lights up the scorecard of a relationship. Mm. When you have a crisis like that, it shatters everything. The, the, because you, the, mm. your reality is broken. You thought you knew your life and suddenly you don't. You know, affairs have always hurt, but they hurt differently today. They have become the shattering of the grand ambition of love. Because if I thought mm -hmm. that I was the one and only, this tells me I'm not. If I thought that I knew my life, this tells me I have a crisis of identity. I have no idea anymore what's what. I knew the future is unpredictable, but I thought I could be sure about the past. Now it makes me question my whole past and the sense of coherence of my reality is broken. And it is a violation of trust. And so the question everybody has is once trust is broken, can it be healed? Can it? Yes. Mm, yes, that's encouraging. And can it be helped without? Can it be healed without therapy, and counselling? I think that good therapy can be enormously helpful because mm. in the moment, particularly in the immediate aftermath, the crisis is so intense. You are flooded by such an avalanche of intense, contradictory emotions. One minute is get out, the next minute is hold, the, hold me. One minute is I hate you, the next minute is I love you. How could you do this to me? Who are you? I thought I knew you. I thought I knew myself. I can't trust you. I can't trust my own perception anymore. So it is so powerful, so intense a shattering that we need guidance. We need support. Mm. It can be therapy. It can be a community. It can be friends. But it needs to be people who let you figure out what you want to do. And especially the shame of staying is such that people today won't talk about it with their friends because they're afraid to be judged. And so now they are trapped in a double secret. The secret of the affair and the secret of choosing to stay with the partner who cheated on them. Mm. Where do I get my positive view from? I think it actually matters because, you know, I don't just say it flippantly. In some situations, no, absolutely not. And this is not a blanket answer. But I do know that I learned a lesson about people who felt betrayed and learned to have faith in humanity again from being the child of two Holocaust survivor parents mm. who spent years in concentration camps and who came out of there with nobody, their entire family decimated. And they arrived to Belgium. And in this community that I grew up with in Belgium, that were all concentration camp survivors, there were two groups of people, the people who did not die and the people who came back to life. Mm. And the people who did not die and lived very tethered to the ground and untrusting and feeling danger was everywhere around the corner, lived one kind of life. And the people who came back to life learned to love again. They learned to have children in a world that they thought was the worst. Mm. They still had hope that actually you needed children to prove humanity, were able to enjoy and to have fun again and to experience joy and to to take risks and to be creative and to throw themselves into the mysteries and the unknown of life. And from that place of watching these people who had been betrayed by humanity, I know that we can come back. And I use that hope, hopefulness in my understanding of how people reclaim a sense of trust with their partner after all the pieces have been broken sometimes. Not always, but sometimes. Esther, do men and women in your experience cheat for different reasons? I know that's a generalisation, but mm -hmm. you must have seen patterns in the thousands of couples that you've seen. Traditionally, 
we would love to say that men cheat because they're bored and they need variety and um, and they're not monogamous by nature and they're natural roamers and mm. they're conquistadors. And we have a whole set of theories that prove that men, you know, are of that kind. And then we have a whole set of theories that are trying to prove that women are domestic creatures and that women never really, that women really love monogamy and that women only cheat because they're lonely and hungry for intimacy. And the truth is we have no idea for two reasons. One, when it comes to sex, everybody lies. And men have always lied by boasting and over-exaggerating. And women have always lied by denying and minimizing in order to protect themselves. But it is also really true that there are still nine countries where women can be killed just for straying. And so we don't know what women want. If the consequences were less dire for women, mm. then we would see what she wants to do. But historically, before she had a scarlet letter, before she stood to lose everything since she was a man's property, before she chose she chose never to see her children again, you bet she needed to be really miserable and lonely and hungry before she dared to take that risk. It's the consequences that have shaped the motives of the women. That doesn't mean that this is in the true nature of women to act this way. So we don't know the fundamental differences. Who cheats more, men or women? I mean, the, as you say, the, the stereotype is that men cheat more, but do you... Women hide better. We know that. They, uh. have all, they, ha they definitely have always needed to hide it better. And we also know that the uh, infidelity gender gap is being closed rapidly. And if the numbers are soaring, it is because women are doing it more. But we probably need to be really clear, what do we mean by cheating? Mm. What, what constitutes an infidelity? What do we define today as transgression? Are we talking about a love story, a parallel life, a chat room, watching porn, a massage with happy ending, staying active on your dating apps while you're already in a new relationship? And I think the definition of infidelity keeps on expanding which is the first time that you can actually cheat on your partner while you're lying next to them in bed. Yes, I was going to ask you about the effect of technology on cheating. Never been easier to cheat, never been harder to keep a secret. <laughs> it, is, it is rampant in that sense. You know, um, the question we ask is this. Divorce, which today has a no-fold option that allows women to leave, um, no pregnancy, because we have contraception, at least in the West, uh, a growing economic independence of women, and yet none of it has made infidelity obsolete. So we do have to ask, why does it happen? What does it mean? And what can we do about it that gives people a sense of respect and dignity as they face some of the worst things that can happen in their relationships? I wanted to ask you about technology a little bit more, that idea of, of you can be lying next to your partner and cheating, essentially, by texting mm -hmm. someone else. Do you recommend snooping? If someone suspects their partner of cheating, what's the best way to approach that? Look, if you've asked your partner five times, mm. if you are very clear that something is fundamentally off, if they continue to tell you no, 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 it is quite understandable that you need a certain certainty. Mm -hmm. You can't just be gaslighted. And you will act in ways that go against your own principles. There is never a black and white answer to mm -hmm. these questions. It really demands more nuance and more carefulness. On the other end, surveillance is not a way to experience trust. <laughs> trust is a leap of faith. Trust is your ability to live with the unknown. If you keep on checking, which means that you don't trust, you basically feed it. It's a beast that you feed that doesn't allow you to actually accept that there are certain things you won't know and you can be safe about it. Mm. So snooping can be a very hungry beast. And at the same time, sometimes you are set up to do so by someone who isn't willing to step up. What are the signs that you should look for? I don't even mean snooping, but in terms of changed behavior in a partner, um, what are some of the most common signs that someone might be cheating? 
They cover a range, you know, suddenly someone is much more attentive to their looks. Somebody has been losing a lot of weight, exercising, grooming themselves. Somebody stays out longer and longer, travels more and more. Uh, somebody is more and more distant or somebody suddenly more and more present. Mm -hmm. um, they're, they're, it's, it's when you experience something fundamentally different mm. in energy, in attention, in presence, in focus, in distractibility. Somebody is taking their phone constantly with them to the bathroom, to every place. Somebody is spending hours and hours on text. Um, but also... This is when you ask, what is the other person doing? I think that sometimes we also need to ask, what are we doing? How absent have we been? How much attention have we not paid? How much sexual frustration have we imposed on the other person? How much neglect have we put? How abusive have we been? How mean? How cold? You know, cheating is what one person does to another person. But often for the person who is experiencing it, it's not about cheating. It's about maybe for the first time finally paying attention to themselves. It's very strange to experience that this is a dual experience. It's a hurtful and a betrayal of one person. But it is often for the other person something that is very, very different. Mm. And I'm not talking just about people who have one night stands here and there. I'm talking about affairs of the heart where people are experiencing a different relationship. And people will come and ask you all kinds of secret questions when you sign the books for them. You know, really? like just an hour ago, you know, can you love two people at the same time? Can you? Of course you can. Of mm. course we it's like can. Loving, is it like loving two children or is that polyamory? No, love can be plural. But it is a question. For some people, it absolutely mm. is not. And for other people and those who have experienced it, it is. But God forbid, they will not be described as people who love two people. They will be described as cheaters and traitors and philanderers, men and women. Mm. And that's why we need a language that is less judgmental, not in order to let people get away with things, but in order to help couples rebuild and repair. Okay, so someone comes to you, a, a new patient, uh, she's been cheating and she wants to know if she should tell her partner. What? How do you handle that? So first of all, a person comes to me, I don't think of her as she's been cheating. Mm. How do you think and of this, her? Le this, has to, this language, because if she's just a cheater, what are we going to do with the person who chooses to stay? How do you give people that choose to stay with someone a level of dignity if we're saying you're staying with a crook? Ah. You're staying with some, you know, you're staying with a person who has betrayed you. You're staying with a person who has violated your trust. You're staying with a person who has taken their love, their desire, their attention to someone else. But they have, haven't they? They have what? Done that, all those things. Yes, they do. But it, 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 it helps to add a few words to this. What words would you add? Okay. Mm. If you went to the opera, if you read the novels, if you went to the movies, you wouldn't just be saying those are cheater stories. You would say those are love stories. Mm. We know the cheating is a, a code word. So if a person comes to me and says, I'm having an affair, then I ask, tell me more. Who's the person? What's been happening? Why now? Why are you here today with me? What is it that you need to answer? When you ask if you should tell, why do you want to tell? You want to tell because you can unload your own bad conscience? For whom are you telling? For you or for your partner? Who's going to benefit from this? What are the consequences from this? Your partner, does your partner want to know? Do you have any idea? Do you know how many people have told me I wish I had never known? Why did you bother telling me? Just so that you could feel better? Mm. So we spend a fair amount of time, we slow it down and we ask, what are the costs and the benefits of truth telling, of transparency, to tell or not to tell and what to tell? What is it you need to tell your partner? That you've almost left the marriage and that you decided at the last moment that you actually, you realized that that this wasn't at all what you wanted to do? Is that what stands out more or the fact that you met somebody else through whom you understood that? That you've decided to leave 
Is that the most important thing or the fact that because you met someone and you realize that you are in a relationship that has not been good to either of you, we analyze it. Because once it's been told, you can never take it back. And because the essence is not always just to say you're cheating. The essence is to say, I miss you. I've wronged you. I've betrayed you. I've lied to you. I have not spoken truth to you, not because I have an affair, but I haven't spoken truth to you for the last 10 years about anything I felt or wanted or needed or about what you were asking from me. I was not responding to you. I've been away for so long. This is the last step of how abandoned, uh, abandoning I have been and how missing in action I have been. Many times, this is not the beginning of a distancing. This is the result of a distancing. Mm. And so what you want is to help people carry accountability and take responsibility for their actions in a way that is caring and compassionate to the other person. And sometimes that means you have to lay it all out. And sometimes that means you have to lay out the essence of what this has been about, but not things that are going to get another person to stay up at night for years on end while you are already sleeping perfectly fine because you've unloaded your negative guilt. Mm. So being honest isn't always the right thing for your partner or for you. Being honest is always the right thing, but being honest isn't always about dumping on your partner being honest Mm. is also understanding and caring about what it's going to be like for your partner to live with this information yes you do need honesty but honesty has to be caring and compassionate Mm. your partner is dealing with illness your partner cannot be there for you in certain ways you have been receiving comfort for someone else do you have to go tell that When I see a partner, many, many, many more partners now in their early 60s, 70s with partners who have early onset of Alzheimer's and they have comfort from another person. Do they have to go tell? Mm. You know, it is the comfort Mm. that they receive from others that is helping them show up every day at a nursing home to someone who barely recognizes them. Are they cheaters? They are the nicest cheaters you would meet. (laughs) So before we do this all or nothing, black and white, I think that when you talk about telling, you really want to know what will be the consequences on the person that you're telling this to, not on you. Sometimes Mm. telling can be cruel. Sometimes telling can be quite aggressive. Let me show you. Let me tell you what I really have done. And I'm just going to pour it on you. Um, It is not always an act of kindness. What we want is kindness and, 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 and honesty. But how it manifests isn't always one and the same. Esther, having children can dramatically change relationships, particularly for the identity of the woman. You know, you you become so, and again, I'm generalizing, but, you, you know, you get a lot of intimacy and a lot of physical intimacy from your children in terms of you're always cuddling them and they're always, you know, you're breastfeeding or you're, it can be quite physically affectionate. So I hear a lot of women say they get a lot of, um, you know, physical affection from their children. They, they, they become very caught up in their identity as a mother mm-hmm. and that can make it hard for them to then flip into the identity as a partner. Mm-hmm. I don't know if it's as hard for men, but to me that seems like it can often be a, a, a danger point or a, or, a, or a pivotal point in many relationships. How can women navigate that so they don't lose themselves? Women holding on to themselves in the context of relationships is their biggest challenge. Mm. How to not lose themselves in relationship to their partner, in relationship to their children, in relationship at work. I mean, the, 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 the greatest relational challenge for women is their ability to experience their sense of autonomy and self-care in the midst of caring for others. Yes. Across the board. Today, the survival of the family depends only on one thing. And that's the quality of the emotional connection between the two partners. Nothing else will hold the family together but that. Mm. You don't have to worry about being excommunicated from the church. You don't have to worry because uh, you can divorce and you will keep your children. You won't be ostracized by the entire community. Nothing 
And so when you think about remaining connected, intimately connected with your partner, physically, emotionally, you're doing it, not just for you. You're doing it for the survival of the family and for your kids for that matter. And once you begin to think about it like that, you have a different sense of motivation. It's no longer I just do this for myself and I have a hard time doing anything for me because I have to think about all the needs of everybody else. It's in fact, I'm doing this for me because when I do this for me, it allows me to preserve this beautiful thing that I have just created. People tell you sex after kids, you must be kidding. So I don't talk about sex. First of all, who cares? You know, women have done sex for centuries and felt nothing. The point is not about just getting it done. The point is to experience an erotic connection, to feel alive, renewed, playful, you know, intimate. And you tell them, look at the children. They are getting an enormous amount of erotic energy, not sexual energy, aliveness, the erotic in the full sense of the word, vibrancy, vitality. The kids get new activities all the time. You, same old, same old. The kids get to wear new clothes all the time. You, same old, same old. The kids get to have languorous hugs. You and your partner, a diet of quick packs. The erotic energy is alive and well, but it is eros redirected. If you want your family to survive, you need to bring back some of that erotic energy into your relationship, some of that playfulness, some of that exploration, some of that curiosity, some of that attention, some of that physicality, some of that touch has to be brought back into your couple. Otherwise, you make each other vulnerable to the kindness of strangers. How do you do that in practical terms? Because, you know, you talk about have we've got the thing for the lunchbox, have you signed the note for the excursion tomorrow, someone's wet the bed, someone's had a nightmare, and then how do you sort of go and flirt with your partner who you've been with for 10 years, who probably saw some babies come out of your vagina, who's seen you in all the, you know, your identity to your partner is so intertwined with your identity as a parent and as a mother. And I've, I've heard a lot of women talk about how what they seek outside their marriages is someone seeing them not as somebody's mother, but seeing them as a woman again. How do you restore that in your relationship after so many years of of being parents? It is this very reality, the de-erotization of the wife and the mother that led me to understand one of the deepest truths about why people even in happy marriages will cheat. And it is the idea that when they seek the gaze of another, it isn't because they want to leave their partner, but it is often because they want to leave the person that they have themselves become. Yes. And it isn't because they want to find somebody else, but they want to find another self. And what is more other than a different version of yourself in ways that women often struggle to find in their committed relationships. If you want to know what women really want sexually, you have to actually look at their behaviors in their affairs, not in their marriages. Unfortunately, for many women in their marriages, they do what they're expected to do. They do what they think they're allowed to do as mothers and as women and how restricted they are. They give themselves, they open up themselves. Why? Because for many women, And I'm not justifying this one bit, but I have tried to understand why these women would would act so fundamentally different in their affairs than they do at home. Because in their affairs, they're doing something that they know is just for themselves. This is one thing that for sure you do not to take care of anybody else. What's an example of how women are behaving differently in affairs than they than they are in their relationships? They actually they feel entitled to ask for what they want. Mm. They feel they feel legitimately entitled or illegitimately entitled to actually do something just for themselves. They allow themselves to be selfish. Look, affairs are always selfish acts. We have to be very clear about this. You are doing something for yourself at the expense of somebody else. You know, but we understand that the biggest blocks for women when they enter re- committed relationships, is they begin to de-eroticize, not just in the sense of desexualize, but they seep the energy out of them and they give it completely over. And then they wonder why they can't remain connected. So I always ask, not what turns you on 
and what turns you off. But I turn myself off when? I turn myself off by is a very different question than you turn me off is or what turns me off is. Mm -hmm. You ask women and they'll tell you, I turn myself off because I'm critical of myself, because I don't take care of myself, because I don't like my body, because I feel like I still have so much to do on my list, because it's been months since I actually just took an hour for myself to take a walk in the woods, to go and see a museum, to go and visit a friend. I neglect myself. I'm depleted. From there, there is no erotic energy. There is nurturing energy, but not erotic energy. And when you ask them, I turn myself on, or I awaken my desire, I connect with my aliveness, which is not the same as what turns me on is, or you turn me on when. Because they'll tell you what to do to turn them on. But if they themselves are shut down, he can do or she can do, because it could be a male or a female partner, whatever. You are not showing up at a reception desk. The shop is closed. There is no response. You actually get annoyed that the other person doesn't see that you're exhausted, that you're not interested. Why the hell are you coming to bother me, to set me up, to say Mm. no? You should just not ask. If you ask her what turns her on, what she talks to you is not about sexual things per se. It turns her on to take care of herself, to pay attention to herself, to be self-indulgent, to allow herself to experience pleasure without the instant sense of responsibility and worry that accompanies her in her role as a wife and as a mother. From that place, she can open up. And so what you explain to the partners is when you do things to help, it's not because doing the dishes are going to help you. It's because anything you do that lets her not feel that she has to be responsible all alone and that there's someone else who is taking the burden of her and saying, you can go think about you, connects her with her erotic self that gives her the permission to experience pleasure when otherwise she would only allow herself to experience a sense of responsibility. Oh, that's magic. Do you understand? <laughs> Esther, that's phenomenal. Um, thank you so much. Uh, I've just, I want to go back and listen to this immediately and write everything down because um, you just speak with, with such wisdom and, and such truth. So thank you so much. Congratulations on the book. Um, and I can't wait to listen to um, your uh, podcast as well. Oh, how good was that? If you want more Esther, if you perhaps want to see what Esther looks like, I was very curious. I had I did this on Skype and um, I'd listened to her so much, uh, other podcasts and interviews, but I didn't know what she looked like. And we did this Skype interview um, with the camera on and uh, sometimes that can be distracting, but she was so engaged. It was the first day of her book tour uh, in the US and she was at a big conference and what I... Th- find so brilliant and engaging about her is that she answers the same questions often but every time she literally leans in you could see when I was talking to her she was leaning towards the computer and she was so engaged in what she was saying and she didn't phone in any of it which can sometimes happen when you know when you're you're an author or you're an expert and you're having to give a hundred interviews on the same topic Um, but she's just so so interesting she has given a TED talk um, back in February 2013 actually it was called the secret to desire in a long-term relationship if you just google Esther Perel um, TED you'll find it it's been viewed more than seven and a half million times And she's got another book that she released about 10 years ago called Mating in Captivity, Unlocking Erotic Intelligence, where she talks about, uh, you know, keeping relationships alive and, and, and the idea of monogamy. She's also got a podcast that you can find on iTunes this week. Uh, it's called Where Shall We Begin? And that's um, a reference to, well, that's what most therapists say when you sit down in front of them, whether it's for the first time. Usually the first time you see them, they say, where shall we begin? Um, it's their opening line. And she has, I think it's 10 episodes or, or nine episodes with real life couples, some gay, some straight, um, all with different issues. Uh, and they talk they have a therapy session they have a th- what's a three-hour session which is distilled into a one-hour episode I think and you get to hear her talking about 
you know, doing her job and, and, and you can learn things by listening to these couples sort of sort through their problems. I have listened to some of the previews and it just sounds phenomenal. I absolutely can't wait um, to hear more of her talking. Uh, but, yeah, I, I'm so looking forward to that. And she talk, told me that she's got actually a second series of that that's going to be coming out, I think, next year that's all about secrets. And she said none of them are actually about um, infidelity. They're all different secrets that can really affect relationships. Thanks for listening to this episode. How great is Esther Perel? Um, I highly recommend her book. It's called The State of Affairs, Rethinking Infidelity. And as with any book that we mention on our podcast, you can find it at apple.co forward slash mamma mia. That's also where you can find all our other shows. I host two of them. Uh, well, I co-host two of them. Mamma Mia Out Loud, which is uh, growing ballistically. That's our sort of flagship show where we discuss me, Holly Wainwright and Jessie Stevens. We talk about all the things women are talking about this week. That's what we did our live show around uh, in Sydney this week. And... Um, That's always huge fun. And then there's also my Tell Me It's Going to Be Okay podcast, which is our political podcast about Trump, which I co-host with the extraordinary journalist Amelia Lester, who has lived in the US for 15 years and who has such brilliant sort of Aussie American insight into everything that's going on. And we just recap pretty much the week in on planet Trump and hold each other over the internet and try to reassure each other that everything's going to be okay. Uh, so we also have a, many, many other shows. If you're pregnant, can I recommend our show Hello Bump? It's the pregnancy group, the, what do you call it, the pregnancy lesson group, the birth classes, whatever it is that you do when you're pregnant, but you don't have to wear pants when you're listening to it and you don't have to sit in a beanbag. And it, that's great. That just is, is hosted by um, Rebecca Judd and um, Monique Bowley and they talk about everything you need to know when you're pregnant. And then we also, um, after you've finished with that podcast and you have a baby, being on maternity leave can be really isolating. Being at home with a little baby can be really isolating because mother's groups aren't for everyone and you can't always get to them. Uh, So we've got a podcast called Year One that Holly Wainwright hosts with Christy Hayes and they talk about all those issues that, that, um, you know, you deal with in that first year. Because with Hello Bump and Year One, you find that, You know, I'm a mum, but my kids are older, so I've sort of got no interest in talking to people about their pregnancies or the first year of their child's life. And I find that with motherhood, the only interesting phase is the phase that you're in at that moment. So if you have tweens uh, or young adults as your children, come talk to me. Uh, But otherwise, you might go want to have a listen to a podcast and uh, that's particularly made for your age and stage if you don't have friends going through that. Because I didn't. When I had my first child, I had no one that was going through the same stages as me. I only wish the podcast had been invented. But the internet hadn't even been invented back then. It was the olden days. Um, This podcast, this podcast, No Filter, was produced by the extraordinary Liza Ratliff, We have produced um, and uh, put together 114 episodes. This is our 114th episode of No Filter. Go back in the feed uh, and listen to others um, because most of them haven't dated. They don't tend to be very timely. uh, So they are good uh, for listening at any time. And please, if you can think of someone who would like this podcast, please tell them about it. If they're interested in this interview with Esther or any of the other No Filters that we've done, um, some people don't really understand podcasts very well yet, so it will be hugely helpful to us and the show. It will help us keep making the show if you share the spread the word, spread the love, um, and give us a review and a five-star rating in the iTunes store. That also would be much appreciated. Until next week, I am Mia Friedman. The director of podcasts is Rachel Corbett, and I will see you on the internet.